up and worship together. We love technical difficulties. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory? When I'm home where my soul belongs Was I love When no one else would show up Was I Jesus to the least of us Was my worship more than just a song
before the foundation of the world that you would send your son. You knew about all the sickness, all the death, all the, the attacks of the enemy, and you knew that Jesus would be the one constant through all eternity. So we call upon your name now. We ask you to speak straight to our hearts, Lord. We ask you to destroy the works of the enemy. The weapons that we warfare with are not earthly, but they are divine for the demolishing of strongholds. God, demolish strongholds today and help us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus, I am so excited today. It's like I woke up and thought today is the day to get working for Jesus. Kat, I'm so excited to find someone who's ready to take action and get things done. Oh man, I am that girl. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I've got something perfect for you. So oh. let's get started. Okay. Ah. What are you doing? Uh, stand up. Remember, 
we were gonna take action. Yeah, but this is where I always sit. Right, but I need more than this. Oh, I know what you're getting at. Okay, Jesus, how much do you want? What? $50, is that enough? Oh, uh, that's not what I meant. Oh, uh, all right, well, 100 then, you know. I mean, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> um, okay, but um, you might not want to cash this till next Friday, you know what I'm saying? Right. There you go. Uh, okay, okay, Kat, really, I, I do think it's great that you want to give, but I want you to mentor a younger woman. Ooh, yeah, right. Well, Jesus, you know, I'm not really into, like, teaching people and stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't really get into that. Okay. Um, okay, you, you know that woman at the office, Amy? Yeah. I want you to take her out to lunch. Tell her about me. Um, well, Amy is different. I mean, like, really different, you know? I know, but she needs to know about me. Mm, and I can tell the people at the church to call her. I mean, they get paid to do things like that. I want you to do that. Jesus, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> no, Kat, the problem is you're too comfortable. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with a true or false. <clears throat> true or false. First one is, and you have a blank there that I want you to fill this in, and you might want to wait just in case, you know, you get it wrong. So let's, let's vote as a group. True or false? We need more access to the Bible. False. Very good. And if you're, uh, if you're a betting person, the odds are the next one's probably going to be true. We need more engagement with the Bible. True. Never in the history of the world has the Bible been as readily available as it is now. How many of you have the Bible app? You version, right? Or you can do all kinds of other things. George, I forgot what you told me the name of that was. Uh, there's a, what's it? Through the Word? Through the Word. Um, I had, I, I, he sent me an email, but you can do devotionals. There's all kinds of different things. You can do it on U version, Through the Word. You can get that app. U version, the Bible app, has been downloaded in over 500 million unique devices. That's million. And if you go to the U version page, you'll see that it's just clicking up. There's about one per second people downloading to unique uh, devices around the world. It offers 2,869 Bible versions in 1,868 languages, all for free with no advertising. Access to the Bible is not our problem. It's engagement with the Bible. That's the problem. And here's what the Bible says about itself. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is, what is that word? And here's the next word, active. And what's the next word? So it's alive. It is not just words on a page. This is the, the best-selling book of all times for a reason. It's because it's alive. When, when you read the Bible, it's not just really you reading the Bible. It's the Bible reading you. Right? This is the Word of God. And it says it's alive, it's active, it's sharper. It is going to pierce you. And I think that that's why maybe some people don't spend a lot of time with it. It's because the Bible's going to tell you the truth. This is a mirror. You can look at it and you can see what you really look like compared to God. And some people just don't like that. It penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And I think that's why people don't want to study it because when you read the Bible, when you study the Bible, you cannot remain the same. And some of us like the way we are, so we don't want the Bible to change the way we are. We'd rather stay in misery. We'd rather stay in sin than allow the God of the universe who loves us and has a plan for us to change us. And so we ignore the Bible. Um, so the Bible talks to our hearts, and, and really that's the problem. The heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. Now, you could just list them. I've listed a few. Adultery is a problem of the heart. Cussing is a problem of the heart. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if you're cussing, then that's what's in your heart. It's what's going to come out. And you need to replace it with the word of God. Gossip, we don't think gossip is a, is a big one. But did you know it's on God's top seven? There are seven things God hates, and gossip is one of them. Gossip is when you're talking to someone about someone else. And let me give you a little hint here. If, you, if someone talks to you about someone else, they will talk about you to someone else. It is the law 
a spiritual law. And so you need to cut that stuff off. Lust is a problem of the heart. Pride, another of God's top seven, is a problem of the heart. Pride says, I'm better than you. Pride says, I don't need what's in the living, active word of God. I don't need it. It's a problem of the heart. It's all right. She's having a good time today. That's, that's Shay. We're, we love you, Shay. When a person, here's the problem. When a person has an erring heart, that is a straying heart, and a disbelieving heart, the result will also be a hardened heart. And a hardened heart is one thing that, that God says will, will drive you further away from him faster than anything else. A hardened heart is insensitive to the word of God. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions. How many of you like to be persecuted? Let me see your hands. I mean, you wake up, this, this is 2023, you're like, Lord, please let me suffer this year. Anyone? What I'd really like, Lord, is a good, big, fat dose of persecution. Was that on anybody's New Year's resolution list or your prayer? No. We may not like it, but persecution is a great tool in the hands of God. And here's why I say that. The fires of persecution have always purified the church. What word do I have on the Lord there? Purified. Because suffering separates true believers from the counterfeit. Paul even said this to the Corinthians. They're fighting, and he said, you know, you shouldn't have division in the church. But he said, he said God's going to use that division to show who's really a believer and who's not. And every time we've gone through division in a church, we've asked God to show us whose hearts are right before God and whose hearts are hardened. And God, would you reconcile us with people whose hearts are, are right before you? And would you either remove the hardened heart of the person? Because it says in the Old Testament that God removes a heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. Would you either remove the hard heart or, this is a prayer we've prayed, or would you remove the person? If they refuse to humble themselves before you and reconcile with other people, God, remove them. And how you remove them, that's up to you, God. Nobody's praying for persecution, right? I would argue that, that COVID revealed people's hearts towards church. Would you agree with that? Um, I know people that I, I, I thought they were strong believers. The moment COVID hit, they said, yeah, we're just going to watch online today. I'd run into people at Walmart, and they go, hey, you know, I got no excuse. Well, you know we're online. Well, yeah, I hadn't been watching online. I think it revealed what our attitudes were towards the church. Y'all remember when we used to have two services? Now we can't fill up one? What's wrong with that? I mean, if it's me, get rid of me. I'm, I'm, I'm being dead serious. If I'm the problem, then, then vote my butt out. Get somebody else. Churches all across the United States have not recovered from COVID because COVID showed who it showed who's true and who's counterfeit. And, and you may think that's harsh, but how else would you explain it? If church is not a priority, the way you feel about the church is the way you feel about God. The way you treat the Bible is the way you treat God. Jesus gave a parable and he talked about the wheat and the tares. Y'all remember this? He's talking to his followers and he said there was, there was a field owner and he planted some wheat. And at night, at night, this is what false teachers, it's what the Antichrist, it's what Satan does. They, he sneaks in secretly and starts planting weeds. And so all of his followers are like, shouldn't we go pull up the weeds? And, and Jesus is like, no, you don't take care. You don't worry about that. Let me worry about that. But here's the point, that, that when, when there is a true Christ follower, Satan is going to plant a counterfeit. If there's a true word of God, there's going to be a false word of God. If there are true preachers of God, there's going to be false preachers of God. In the first century, there were false teachers everywhere. Would a rational person think there's less false teachers today than in the time of the apostles? I'm in 2 Peter, and he's just railing. He said, deepest, darkest blackness is reserved for false teachers. We need to be real careful what we're teaching. See, not everyone who shows up to church is a true Christian. 
True believers, here's how we find out, are willing to suffer for Christ. And they hold firmly to their convictions and the confession of their faith. We see what Hebrews says. Hebrews 3, 14 says this, But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire household. And, and we are God's house. And here's, here's the biggest word in Scripture, the biggest two-letter word in Scripture. We are God's house. What is that word? If we keep our courage and remain confident in the hope. Now, let me say this. This is on your listening guide. We're not saved by holding on to our confession. The fact that we hold on to our confession of faith is proof that we're God's true children. You with me? The Word of God is living and active. It exposes our hearts. And then if we trust God, the Word enables our hearts to trust God, to listen to God, to obey God, claim His promises. And and then if you keep reading in in the Scripture, it says that we can enter into God's rest, but only obedient people get to enter into God's rest. Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content. And, And That word actually means I've been initiated into the fraternity of the content people. He says, I've learned, I've been initiated. I think most of us have not been initiated into the fraternity of contentment. Would you agree with that? Let me let me ask it again. Would you say that most people you know have been initiated, they've learned the secret of being content in this world? No. I think here's part of the problem. In in Hebrews 13, um, the writer is talking about the importance of hospitality. And let me just say, I've never seen a church do as well as you guys do when we have funerals here. So Bruce's funeral was on, on Friday, and this place was packed. And there was plenty of food, and we served, and we, you know, every, it seems like every time now when we're cleaning up, we, we, we clean up in record time. Somebody will look at the clock and go, man, that was 20 minutes, we're out of here. And it was, it was unbelievable, the spread of food we had out there. It was unbelievable, the attitude the people had who, who were serving. Those of you who brought food, thank you so much. You, I can't tell you how it blesses my heart to be able to be up here and say, hey, we're going to have food and you are welcome to stay and you're welcome to eat. And then we have more than enough. And the family always says, thank you. They're blown away by our hospitality. The writer of Hebrews says we need to be very careful that we're, we're hospitable to people. He, said, he says, because sometimes we have... We have entertained angels, and we didn't even know about it. Angels unaware. Well, there's a, there's a writer. Before you put that up there, Krista, there's this writer. His name is John Flavel. He was a Puritan Presbyterian minister in the 1600s, and I just thought this was, this was interesting. He was, he was a writer. He was a teacher. He was a pastor, and he thought that preaching should be, this is a quote, hissing hot, searching and expository. Now, he was not the kind of guy that was spitting and fire coming out. But what he said was the word of God is so powerful that preaching should penetrate your heart. It should be, what did I say? Hissing hot. Hissing hot. Okay, here's the problem that I see in, in our churches and in Christians. And this is a quote from John Flavel. By entertaining strange persons, men, women sometimes entertain angels underwear. That's straight out of scripture. But look at this but by entertaining of strange doctrines, false teaching. Many have entertained devils unaware. You start jacking around with false teaching, you're throwing open the door of the enemy of God to come into your heart and to mess up your mind, to mess up your spirit. He wants to destroy you. It's what he does. So we need to be very careful who we listen to and how we listen to it. The word of God is alive. It's not just words. It's transforming. It's powerful. It's active. And since this is true, it begs the question, why are so many Christians living anemic, powerless lives? Well, before I show you the answer from Scripture, let me ask you some questions. How many of you own a Bible? Crowd participation. All right. If you're online, I want you to say, I do. Hopefully we're online. We had uh, Facebook crashed right before church today. That's why we had to restart the the, uh, countdown. So put, I have one. All right, how many of you have more than one Bible? All right, that's a lot of you. All right. Now, have you ever heard those people say, don't you lie in church? All right, so don't you lie in church. God is here. Don't you lie in the presence of God. When I'm about to ask you, I want total honesty. How many of you did not read your Bible every single day this week? Okay, wow, y'all are honest. Good. 
That's good and bad. <laughs> That's a whole lot of people. And so I, I'm just asking a question. No condemnation. But my question is, why did so many people raise their hands? And I think there's a combination of things. I think, number one, we, we, don't, we don't really believe that this is the word of God. Um, is it because the Bible's not accessible? Is that why you didn't read every day? No. It's because we don't value what it has to say because you spend time on what you value. Here's what the word says. David was writing in Psalm 119, and he says, I delight in your dec decrees. I will not neglect your word. Now, this word neglect, it actually comes from the Hebrew word shaka. That's kind of a fun word to say, so say shaka. It, it means this, to lay aside, to forget, to take for granted, to neglect. On the video in just a minute, he's going he's gonna to come back to this. Craig Rochelle is going to come back to it, and he's actually going to chunk the Bible and say, we, we, we should call the Word of God. When is the last time you delighted in something? When is the last time you delighted in God's Word? Too often we do just, just the opposite of this verse. We, we, we ignore your decrees. And we do neglect your word. That shouldn't be. So we're going to watch this video. And, and at the end, like I said, you don't have to take notes on this. I'm going to give you a piece of paper that has all of the notes on it when you leave today. But I want you to see this video. And I want you to think about why we don't take it seriously. I think it's because we don't know what, what has happened in history to get us the word of God. And I think that we, we sometimes underestimate the God of the word. Let's watch this. Let's talk about how God brought his word to us. It started thousands and thousands of years ago, somewhere between 1400 and 1500 BC, when God himself wrote the Ten Commandments on stone and inscribed these very first words of God in an ancient form of Hebrew. God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai and God begins speaking his word to us. Years later, the very first scriptures, they were known as the Pentateuch, and they're now the first five books of the Bible. They include Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And for thousands and thousands of years, scripture was recorded on animal skins that were called scrolls. Uh, a scribe might use the animal skin of a deer or a cow or a sheep never a pig, a pig would have been unclean, and that would have been totally inappropriate for God's word. What's interesting is, when the entire Pentateuch is found on a scroll, it's called a Torah. And a Torah scroll, if it would be completely unraveled, would be over 150 feet in distance. This scroll was so long that it would often take an entire herd of sheep just to make one Torah scroll. By approximately 500 BC, the 39 books that we know today as the Old Testament were completed and continue to be preserved in Hebrew on scrolls. By the end of the first century AD, the New Testament was completed and it was preserved in the Greek language on papyrus a thin paper-like material made from crushed and flattened stalks of a reed-like plant. In the year 367 AD, the Bishop of Alexandria, a guy by the name of Athanasius, wrote his Easter letter. And in it, he listed all of the books that you read today in the New Testament. Then in the year 393 AD, the African Synod of Hippo approved all of the books that you find listed as your New Testament today.
the year 500 AD, the Bible had been translated into over 500 different languages. People all over were so thankful because they could read God's word in their own language. But then something very unusual happened. In just the next century, the next 100 years, by the year 600 AD, the Bible was only allowed in one language. Why is that? Well, the Catholic Church of Rome at the time was the only recognized church in the land. And they issued a decree that no Bible in any other language was allowed. If anyone found a Bible in any language besides Latin, that person holding that Bible could be executed on the spot. You may be wondering, well, why, why did this happen? Well, unfortunately, the Catholic Church became very, very corrupt. The priests were the only one educated in the Latin language, so the common person could never, ever read God's Word. Well, that gave the priests ultimate power. They could teach what parts of the Bible they wanted to, and they could even throw in some things that weren't in the Bible at all, and that was very common. In fact, it was common for a person to go and to pay for indulgences. In, in, in a sense, they were paying for forgiveness. If they sinned, they'd pay a certain amount of money, and the priest would say, well, because you paid that, now you're forgiven. The Catholic Church also taught about a place called purgatory, a word that's not found in Scripture, but they said if your relative dies, they go to purgatory, kind of a holding place, a place that you really don't want to be, but for a certain amount of money, you can purchase the freedom for your relative from purgatory. In today's world, it would kind of be like this. If your grandma dies for $99.95, you can buy a grandma a ticket out of purgatory. The priest used this forced ignorance, and between the years 400 A.D. and 1400 A.D., they deceived the masses during a 1,000-year period, which became known as the Dark Ages. the church break free from this long season of dark and horrible corruption? Well, the answer is simple. Once the Bible, the truth of God's word, got into the hands of enough people and the right people, God used his truth through people to bring about the very necessary reformation of the church. Here's kind of how it happened. In the year 563 AD, there was a guy named Columba. You may have seen his television show. Yeah, he, he was a guy with a glass eye. Okay, sorry. Uh, Columba was a guy who started a secret Bible society or a Bible school where they could faithfully teach God's word. And this group of people became the remnant on earth where God's word was taught faithfully century after century after century. The students were known as the Chaldees. It's a term that means a certain stranger. They were strangers of this world. But for 700 years, the Chaldees would disciple one another, and they faithfully studied God's word. In fact, it was out of this group that God raised up the right people to bring about the Reformation. In fact, in the late 1300s, one of these, a guy by the name of John Wycliffe, or some people pronounce his name John Wycliffe, was a man that God used to do tremendous things. In fact, he was the very first guy to translate the Bible into the English language. When he did so, all of a sudden, all these people who before couldn't read scripture were now able to do so. At this time, some say that it would take about 10 months to translate one single Bible, 10 months for people to work to get the Bible translated into this language. Well, he was faithful in spreading God's word, but unfortunately, he was called a heretic. And the Pope was so disgusted by this guy that 44 years after his death, the Pope ordered Wycliffe's bones to be dug up, to be destroyed, and then to be spread across the river. Some people say that Wycliffe was actually the morning star of the Reformation. He was the one that God used to start the ball rolling in the very necessary reformation of the church. Wycliffe also had a disciple or another student whose name was John Huss. And Huss was equally passionate about getting God's word into as many hands of people as possible. Well, unfortunately, Huss too was called a heretic and was actually burned at the stake. But get this, 
What do you think they used to start the fire around Huss as they burned him at the stake? They used his teacher, Wycliffe's Bibles. So they spread Bibles all around him and lit the Bibles on fire to burn Huss at the stake. But it was Huss's final words that became known as a prophecy that helped direct the future of the church. At the stake before he was burned, the last words of John Huss were these. He said, in the next 100 years, God will raise up a man whose call for reform cannot be suppressed. And that's exactly what God did. In the year 1517, God raised up the man named Martin Luther, who was so fed up with all of the corruption in the church, he actually believed that God was calling him to help reform the church. In fact, it was on All Hallows Eve that Martin Luther took what became known as his 95 Thesis. It was a document with 95 claims of heresy. And he took his 95 Thesis and he went and he nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg Church. People now describe that event as the knock that was heard around the world. God used those accusations of heresy to spark what's become known as the Reformation of the Protestant Church. God also used Martin Luther to take the Bible and to translate it into the German language. He then took the recent invention called the printing press, the invention of Gutenberg, and he leveraged it to now get the Bible into the hands of the masses. Of course, Luther was called a heretic. People wanted to kill him, and he had to spend much of his life on the run. But God used him to spark major changes in the church and to get the word of God into the hands of the masses. About that same time, there was another guy, an Oxford professor. His name was John Collet, and he translated the Bible into English for his Oxford students. He also taught the Bible in the English language at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where, believe it or not, over 20,000 people would pack themselves into this cathedral simply to hear the Word of God in a language that they could understand. Not only were 20,000 people in the building, but it said that as many people would be outside the building waiting for their turn to get in. Why? Because they were hungry, desperate. They would do anything to simply hear the Word of God. What's sad is that beautiful historic cathedral still exists today, but instead of over 20,000 people a weekend, they minister to about 200 people a weekend. And most of these are simply tourists. In the year 1526, there was a guy named William Tyndale who befriended Martin Luther, and God used William Tyndale to print the very first English Bible. That's the good news. The bad news is, Anyone who was caught with this illegal Bible would be executed immediately. You can only imagine what a demand there would be for people that, that read English and wanted to read God's Word in a language that they could understand. They would do almost anything to get God's Word into their hands. These people, they were incredibly creative and would often smuggle Bibles into England using all sorts of different means. Occasionally, they'd, they'd put Bibles in bales of cotton to smuggle them in, or other times they'd put Bibles into bags full of flour. Ironically, the biggest buyers of Tyndale's Bibles were actually the king's men. That's right. The king's men would buy up as many English Bibles as they could, not because they wanted to read them, but instead because they wanted to burn and destroy all of Tyndale's Bibles. Well, Tyndale, he was a good businessman, and he would simply take the profits of all these Bibles the king's men would buy, and he would use the money to print even more Bibles to get the Word of God out. Unfortunately, because what he was doing was considered illegal, Tyndale was on the run for 11 years of his life. Imagine waking up every single morning 
knowing that people were hunting you down, wanting to kill you, simply because you want to help other people experience the Word of God. That's what Tyndale experienced. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, he was on the run, running for his life as people wanted to execute him. Sadly, they eventually caught up to him and incarcerated him for about 500 days before they finally decided in the year 1536 to burn him at the stake. His last words though, were a prayer to God, which people will remember forever. He prayed, oh Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And three years later in 1539, God answered that prayer. Not only did the King of England allow the printing of the Bible in the English language, but he actually helped to fund it, setting the word of God free. Think about this. Remember all the people who died, gave their lives fighting with everything in them to help God's living and active word be available to you. And sadly, so many people today, they shook off, neglect God's living word. couple of verses and we're done. Romans 13, 14 says this, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it, it, the idea is we're supposed to take off the things of this world and we're supposed to put on Jesus Christ. So clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to de- gratify the desires of the flesh. So I want you to say that. I want you to remember this phrase. So say, gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, remember that. Now I'm going to read you a couple of verses and then we'll finish up. But in my study right now, I'm in 2 Peter. And 2 Peter is all about false teachers and deepest, darkest blackness is reserved for, for false teachers. I want to read you a few verses and then I've got one more verse to put up on the screen. Peter says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to, good, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Then he says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, all of these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to succeed in the Christian life? You've got to have these in increasing measure. Um, And then he says this. This is the verse I want to put up on the screen. For whoever does not have these qualities, she was just getting your attention. Whoever does not have these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten. I want you to say forgotten. Forgotten. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. See, if you feed your mind and your soul the word of God, then, then the garbage of this world will be unattractive to you. But if you sit around and you think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh, you will disobey God and start down a path that is far from God. If you were, if you were in, a, let's say, a boat or a ship that capsized and you knew it was going down and you couldn't get out at the moment, what would you look for? Pockets of what? Air. Why? Because that's what's going to sustain you until either someone comes and rescues you or you can figure out how to get out. My point is we live in a world that is capsized and is going down. And the only oxygen for your spirit, your mind, and your soul is the Word of God. Oh, how I pray you don't shakaw the Word of God. That you won't lay aside, you won't neglect the Word of God. Because if you do, I can tell you where you're going to end up. You're going to go down. Is that what you want? It's time we got serious about the word. Because times aren't getting better. Let's pray together. Father, would you ignite in us a desire, a passion for your word, a hunger for your word. 
God, you know I pray for my grandsons every day that they'll have a hunger for your word. Well, I'm praying it over this congregation now. That we won't see the word as, as, as something we have to check off our list. Like you're some, some weak God that we have to try to impress. No, you're the, you're the God of all power. And you've given us everything. Peter says earlier, you've given us everything we need for a life of godliness through our knowledge of you who called us by your own glory and goodness. But the problem is we don't have everything we need because we don't know you and we don't know your word. And so for that, I'm confessing it's a sin, God. And I'm praying that you'll, you'll light a fire in this congregation. Listening to stories about Bruce the other night or the other day about how he just wanted to tell people about Jesus. And folks thought he was crazy because he wanted to tell people about Jesus. I think we need a few more crazy people in New Life Community Church. So now that Bruce is walking the streets with you, I pray that you raise up some more people who are, who are radically obedient to a passionate pursuit of knowing you and making you known. And I pray you start that process in 2023, and I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.